This is the real payoff of speed cleaning, more free time. Hi, my name is Jeff Campbell, and about 12 years ago, I started a cleaning service in San Francisco called The Clean Team. During the years since then, we've learned a lot about cleaning, and we're getting better and better at cleaning houses well and fast, really fast. We've perfected our cleaning system and described it in a couple of books published by Dell. They're really our trade secrets. You might have guessed one of those books is called Speed Cleaning. This tape is based on that book. This tape is going to give you a clear step-by-step -step method for cleaning your house on a weekly basis. What to do first, what to do second, what tools to carry, and how to proceed until you've completed the entire house. What it's not going to be about is heavy cleaning. You know, things like washing the windows or stripping the floors. That's actually covered in another book called Spring Cleaning. This book is also published by Dell. What we're talking about here is routine cleaning. You might call it maintenance cleaning. You know, things like thoroughly cleaning the kitchen and the bathroom, and then dusting and vacuuming the rest of the house. Another thing we're not going to talk about or give you are a bunch of house cleaning hints. I mean, why hint? Why not give you the whole story? Believe it or not, our three-person teams can clean an average San Francisco home thoroughly, top to bottom, in about 42 minutes. We can clean a one-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment in about 18 minutes. And we're going to teach you those exact skills so you can use them either by yourself or in your own team. Depending on your own family or household, you may or may not be able to pull off this team idea. But the system works just as well, whether it's men, women, or children, you know, depending on their abilities. The floor doesn't really know who's scrubbing it, so everyone can kind of pitch in. Actually, if you stop and think about it, no one ever really teaches us how to clean. But don't worry, what we're talking about here is working smarter, not harder. And also, you don't really need to worry about me trying to talk you into liking house cleaning. You can go ahead, you can hate it if you like, you can love it too, but I can really show you how to get it over with quickly and to eliminate a lot of the frustration that makes house cleaning quite so time consuming. We can also eliminate house cleaning as a source of conflict in your household. You know, households in the 90s are under more time pressure than ever before especially when both spouses are pursuing a demanding career and trying to cope with the responsibilities at home at the same time, including being an involved parent. You need some relief from that pressure. And that's what this is really all about, developing a system for you to reclaim something very valuable in your life, time. Time to relax, to spend with your spouse and children, to start something new in your life. That's also why this is so personally satisfying to me. This isn't just about house cleaning. It's also about your well-being and that of your loved ones. First, let's take a look at what we're going to cover in this tape. We'll start out by reviewing the equipment and supplies that we've found to work best after years of field testing. Then we'll take you through each of the main rooms of the house, step by step starting with the kitchen, then everybody's favorite room to clean, the bathroom, then dusting and polishing in the living room, dining room, and so forth, and then some vacuuming techniques, and finally some information on where to find the right equipment and cleaning supplies. Those are the main points that we're going to cover in this tape. Never, never forgetting that the whole idea is to learn how to get it over with fast and reclaim some extra time. There'll be no lingering, no dawdling, no fussing, and especially no cute little hints allowed.
In the speed cleaning book, we boiled our system down to 13 rules. Here we're going to talk about the first two most important rules, and we'll sneak in the other rules later on when you're not looking. The first rule, and the most important rule, is to make every move count. You may know what it's like to work without a system. You're zigzagging back and forth across the house. You're repeating steps you know you don't need to, and you're making more and more work for yourself. In short, you're working more than you need to, but you're getting less done than you could. Rule one will fix that. When you learn to make every move count, you'll learn to work in a sequence that makes good common sense without backtracking. Once around the room and you're done, except for the floor. Keep this rule in mind at all times when you're cleaning. Make every move count. To make every move count, you've got to observe rule two. Use the right tools. Regarding tools, what you don't need is a collection of gadgets. What you do need are very few professional tools that really work. Anything that takes up as much time as cleaning deserves its own no-nonsense tools. And we found out that the single most important tool turns out to be a work apron such as the one that I'm wearing. When we were first developing our system, we knew we needed to just make one trip around the room when we were doing the work. Well, the solution seems obvious now. You've got to carry everything with you. And the easiest and the most comfortable way to do that is with a cleaning apron. It's a little bit like a carpenter's belt. Um, you know, you and I wouldn't even hire a carpenter that ran up and down the ladder every time he, need, he needed a nail. But that's the way many of us have been going about cleaning the house for years. We're making trip after trip back and forth and across and through the house. We had so much trouble actually trying to adapt other people's aprons to this, such as carpenter's aprons or other things. They didn't have enough pockets or something. They just didn't work. Things fell out of them. So we ultimately designed our own apron specifically for cleaning. It has seven specialized pockets, three of which are dedicated to small tools that we'll talk about. There's another pocket for carrying cleaning cloths. There's a pocket for debris. And very importantly, there are two loops so that you can carry the spray cleaners that you're going to need to clean the house with. After speed cleaning was published, we received a real avalanche of, of requests from people who wanted more information about the products we use, particularly our apron. Since it can be somewhat time consuming, try to locate some of these products. And since our whole point is to try to save you some time, we put together a little, co a little catalog that lists all of the products that we use. Uh, if you would like to mail order this exact apron or any product that we talk about in the tape, we're going to show you how at the end of the tape. But we want to be fair-minded about other products also. You don't have to order anything from us or from anyone else. You can use the products that you have at hand. Especially when you're first learning, actually, the system is more important than the products anyway. It's a little bit like learning how to type. First learn how to type and then worry about what type of typewriter to have. But some products really are better and some products really are faster and some products are safer both to you personally and to the environment. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to list them for you so that you can see the products that we actually use. In this section of the tape, we're going to talk about the items that you need for cleaning every room in the house, whether it's the kitchen, the bathroom, or the living room. Later on, we'll talk about a few other items that are unique to each room, but we won't talk about them until we're actually cleaning that room. The first group of products we're going to talk about are all the products that we carry in our apron. And the first product in the apron is our red juice. Red juice happens to be our favorite cleaning product. It's a heavy-duty liquid cleaner, similar to like 409 or Fantastic. It happens to be non-toxic, it's odorless, it's biodegradable, it's USDA approved for use around kitchens. And it doesn't make, it co make us cough like some of the, the uh, grocery store brands that we've tried. It's a champion degreaser and cleaner, and we use it for everything from fingerprints to spotting carpets. You need to keep the top of the spray bottle tight at all times. If it should ever come loose, it can cause a real mess. And notice that the top is also color-coded so that we can quickly grab for whatever cleaner we want. 
always put it back in your apron in the same spot. If you're right-handed, we suggest you put it back on your right-hand side since you'll be using it more than our second cleaner, which is Blue Juice. Blue Juice is a light-duty liquid cleaner, similar to Windex or that type of product. Like Red Juice, though, we think it's both better and safer than the other products that are available. It's good for light jobs, such as cleaning glass windows, glass in the pictures, or mirrors. Like Red Juice, put Blue Juice back in the same spot on your apron. The next product is a cleaning cloth. It's really at the heart of our whole cleaning system. What we use are high quality, all cotton table napkins that are hemmed, so they don't become unraveled. They are highly absorbent. They are as lint-free as anything gets. We tell you to throw away your old underwear, throw away those old t-shirts you've been saving. Don't even think about using polyester, which is highly unabsorbent. Don't use any cloths that have color in them because it could come off on the wall that you're trying to clean. And we definitely don't recommend sponges. Sponges don't absorb as well as cleaning cloth. You can't scrub it with them like you can with a cleaning cloth. And you have to rinse them over and over again. And even when you're finished, they're not dry. The surface isn't dry, and you have to wipe it with something or another. Clean cloths, on the other hand, can usually wipe a surface clean and dry in one or two swipes. And then you just toss them in the washing machine. So over time, they're a lot cheaper besides. It's important that you know how to fold them so that you can fold them that they don't all fall out of your apron at the same time. So let me show you. It's real easy. Just fold it once, fold it twice, fold it in the middle. This also gives you several different surfaces that you can use uh, for, for cleaning surfaces when you're actually using it. There are two options for the cleaning cloths. One of them is good old-fashioned cotton diapers. You probably remember them. They're a little, little hard to find these days. Try to get the ones that are not pre-folded. The other option are paper towels. This is kind of an expensive option compared to cleaning cloths because you've got to keep replacing them uh, over and over again, not to mention however many trees it takes to make the paper towels. However, if you're going to use paper towels, use the best ones available, and they happen to be Bounty microwave paper towels. Those are the ones to pick if that's your option. The next tool is a toothbrush. We call it a toothbrush, but it's actually a stiff bristled brush that's angled to get into tight spots. You'll notice a real difference in cleaning power when you compare this to a cleaning cloth alone. A lot of surfaces appear to be smooth, but they're actually irregular. With this brush, you can actually dig into the irregular, irregularities in the surface and actually clean the surface much better when a cleaning cloth is apt to smooth right over the top of the irregularities. Besides those types of surfaces, it's also great for a light switch plate, it's good for tight spots like around a faucet or the knobs on a stove. We even use it for spotting carpets. The next tool we're going to talk about is another one that has its own dedicated pocket in the apron, and it's a scraper. It's actually a little spatula like you'll see a painter use when they're doing spackul spackling, but it's used when even a toothbrush will take too long. An example would be when you were cleaning, say, for instance, pancake lumps off of a counter. You know how they kind of turn to stone overnight? You can wipe and wipe with your cleaning cloth, or you can scrub and scrub with your toothbrush, and it won't come off. However, if you take your scraper and quickly pop them loose, you're done with that job, and you can move on. There are a couple of precautions when using your, your uh, scraper. Use it at a low angle. It's harder to scratch a surface if you keep the uh, scraper at a very low angle. And also, get the surface wet with some of your red juice or blue juice because it's also harder to scratch a wet surface than a dry surface. But to be safe, always test that in that famous inconspicuous spot. The next tool is another one of the tools that has its own little pocket. And it's a razor blade and a razor blade holder. Use this for some chores that otherwise can be very difficult, such as trying to get the soap scum off of a shower door, or use it to clean the inside of an oven door and get that baked on grimy stuff off of there. It's also great for getting a spot of paint off of a mirror that may have been there for five years. If you carry this tool, you'll actually take it off. The next tool that we're talking about is not a tool at all, but two of the largest pockets in the apron have replaceable pocket liners. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is for debris. 
If you come across, say, an ashtray full of cigarette butts when you're doing your cleaning, your first, first impulse is to go off looking for a garbage can. Well, you have no excuse to do that. You'll just dump it into your plastic line pocket and uh, keep on cleaning. The other one is to help keep you dry. It's a place to put your wet cleaning cloths. Well, that's about it for all of the tools that we carry in our apron. Now we're going to talk about the pockets that we, or the tools that we carry in our back pocket, which means that we like to clean houses wearing pants that have two back pockets. If you don't have a pair of pants that have a couple of back pockets, or if you happen to like cleaning house in the nude, I guess you're just going to have to improvise. The first one is a whisk broom. It's great for getting cat hair off of the couch or getting a few cookie crumbs off the couch so you don't have to drag out the vacuum cleaner to do it. It's also perfect for getting that little edge of the carpet that the vacuum cleaner never gets, no matter what the vacuum cleaner salesman tells you. The other pocket, we carry one more tool, and it's a feather duster. It's a very special feather duster, however. It's made of genuine ostrich down feathers. Only ostrich down actually attracts dust. It's also very soft and pliable, which means you can get into some very tight spots with it. Definitely don't get one of those tacky, cheap, fluorescent orange feather dusters. They're absolutely worthless. So how are you going to store all these supplies? Well, we have an idea there. We use a carry-all tray. We've got one with steep sides so that your uh, items won't fall out. And it's made of strong plastic, so it's literally indestructible. It's great for storing supplies that are not carried in your apron, such as a comet or extra cleaning cloths. It's great for carrying your supplies from room to room. Uh, it protects the surfaces of your house. And it's a good place to store things in between your weekly cleanings. Let's stick some of these items in here. And speaking of storing your items between weekly cleanings, try to select a storage place that's a little bit higher than underneath the kitchen sink. That's not a good place. The kids can get to it. And besides which, it's hard to find things under there. If you want to save time cleaning, you don't want to struggle around trying to find your cleaning supplies every week. That's it for the tools and supplies that you need no matter what room you're cleaning. There are a few others that we'll talk about when we're actually cleaning the other rooms that are involved. Over the years, we've tried just about every possible combination of strategies for cleaning, and we've found that what works best for our company is to work in teams of three. But it doesn't matter if you're going to be working alone or whether you're going to be working in a team of two or three or four. We're going to explain one job at a time. First, we'll talk about how to clean the kitchen. Then we're going to talk about how to clean the bathroom. And then we'll talk about how to clean the rest of the house. First, we'll show you exactly what you put in your apron and what you put into your carry-all tray. And then we'll go through that room step by step so that you can learn it perfectly. By the way, at least for now, we're the boss. We're going to relieve you of the responsibility of having to make any decisions. Maybe later, after you've got the, the system down pat, you can make an adaptation. But for now, let's do it this way, and you'll learn how to get it over with fast. And speaking of fast, it's just about time to speed clean the kitchen. We just have one thing left to do, and that's to talk about the few extra supplies you need for cleaning that room. Hello again. We've already talked about the products that we need for general cleaning. Let's talk about the few extra products that we need just for cleaning the kitchen. I'm going to make a little room in this cleaning tray, and then we'll load them up. The first product we need is good old-fashioned Comet. We've always had the best luck with Comet compared to the other brands, and Comet now has a safer formula, at least according to the manufacturer, that's good for most all surfaces. As with anything, though, you can scratch practically any surface if you bear down hard enough, so be careful with it. If you're so inclined, you may want to uh, use rubber gloves. Rubber gloves, if you're going to use them, use the professional kind. They have a nice long sleeve so that water doesn't dribble down your arm and so that they don't rip about two seconds after you've put them on. One other thing, kind of contrary to common belief, they don't have to be skin tight. This isn't brain surgery. You don't want to have to wrestle them on and off every time you clean. You see, what else do we have in here? Here's a white pad. 
You've probably seen one of these. This is made by 3M, but it's a sponge on one side and it's a scratch pad on the other. It comes in several different colors. The white's the one that's safe for almost all surfaces you'll find in the kitchen or the bathroom. But be careful of green or black or blue or other colors of it, which can damage a lot of surfaces. Even the white pad, if you used it on certain highly polished surfaces, like lacquered, for instance, it could scratch that. So we'll put that in our tray also. Let me see. We've got steel wool here. Steel wool is something that can come in real handy when you're trying to clean a stove top. You've got to be careful with it because steel wool can scratch. However, if you get the triple zero, that's safe on most stove tops and it can really save your life on certain hard things to clean. One other thing that we need is some, something to clean the floor with. And what we use is clear ammonia. Good old fashioned clear ammonia. Not sudsy, not detergent, not anything else but clear ammonia. Ammonia actually cleans just fine without suds. In fact, we're convinced that suds was added by some marketeer who thinks that we probably will feel better if we see suds on the floor. But suds just take a long time to remove, and they don't make the ammonia work any better. Ammonia all by itself is a great cleaner. It's strong, it's effective, and it's quite inexpensive. One other thing that we need is a supply of cleaning cloths. Probably 10 or 12 are plenty to clean your kitchen. You know, there is one little other thing that we should talk about. House cleaning isn't really fraught with danger or anything, but there are a couple of precautions that you should take. The first precaution is don't ever mix your cleaners. And one of the cleaners we were just talking about, ammonia, when mixed with bleach, can produce a deadly gas. Just be careful and never, never mix any cleaners. There is another precaution, I'm sure you've heard it before, but that is to read the labels and follow the directions. There is one other thing we need to clean the kitchen, and that is a mop. This funny looking thing is a mop, and we're going to talk about it a lot more when we clean the floor, but just suffice it to say that it's an improvement over the mop that you're used to using. Well, I think I'm just about out of excuses. I think it's time to go speed clean the kitchen, finally. I'm going to clean it for you from top to bottom, and I'll meet you there. First, put your mop just inside the door. And next, put your carry-all tray on the counter. You're always going to start cleaning the kitchen from the same spot. And that spot is to the right of the sink. Now it's time to get dressed. So let's put on our apron first. A smart way to put on the apron is to put it on backwards. That way you can see the, yourself tying the bow, which is a little bit easier than trying to do it you know, behind you. When you get it tied, just pull it around. Now you've got it into place. It's a good time to check and make sure that you have your little tools. Remember, you've got a toothbrush, you've got a scraper, and down here is the razor. And they're all where they belong. You need a few cleaning cloths. Take some of them out of your tray and put them into your apron pocket. And you notice I didn't say stuff them in your apron pocket, but put them in there in a nice, organized way so you can pull them out one at a time when you're using them to clean the kitchen. You remember you've got two plastic lined pockets. The first one is to carry your white pad in. Your white pad will quickly be wet and the plastic will keep you from being wet also. And the other one is for debris, you probably remember. Now, red juice, check to make sure it's tight and then put it on the right side as long as you're right-handed. Put it on the left side if you're left-handed. Set your blue juice in place also. So. Now we've got our apron is full, and we need a couple of tools that go in the back pocket. One of them is a whisk broom. The whisk broom comes in real handy in the kitchen, especially if it is carpeted. And finally, we need a feather duster, and put that in the second back pocket. Now, one other thing before we actually start is let's take this uh, throw rug out of here. That way it won't be in the way when ready to do the mopping. This is a good time to empty the trash also, so let's grab that. And what I'm going to do is take them outside the room and I'll leave the garbage here where I can pick it up and empty it later. And I'm going to throw the carpet or the throw rug down here where I can vacuum it late later. Take the time to make sure that it's down really flat because sooner or later when you do get around to vacuuming it, you won't have to stop and straighten it again. You're not making work for yourself, in other words. The strategy for cleaning the kitchen, or any other room for that matter, is to work your way around the room once, never backtracking, 
always progressing to the right. And at the same time, you're going to be observing rule number three, and that is work from top to bottom. And we say for emphasis, always, period, don't argue. And the reason for that is, is because there are no exceptions to that rule. If you don't work from top to bottom, you'll continually make work for yourself because dust and debris and even cleaning solution will drift back down onto a surface that you've already cleaned. Besides being time consuming, it's also very exasperating. It's also why we do the floor last. You can knock debris on the floor while you're cleaning it and you can pick it up when you do the floor and it makes no sense to do it any other time but last. For now, we're going to start over here to the right of the sink. And following our rule of working from top to bottom, let's first look for cobwebs up here. And there are a couple, so we'll knock those down. And there isn't really much else to clean here, but we can get the dust off of these curtains. Now we're going to clean the countertop, where we uh, the first part area of the countertop. So lift up your cleaning tray. It requires a little red juice, and it requires a cleaning cloth. And now we'll wipe it clean and dry. Did you notice how I set my red juice back in my apron without even looking? It's so automatic. Always put your tools back in the same place. It's, it's quite surprising how quickly you get good at this. Once I started a cleaning cloth, instead of putting it back in my apron, I throw it over my shoulder where it's easy to grab for the next juice. Continuing on down, you need red juice and a cleaning cloth for the cupboards below, and be sure to grab for your toothbrush whenever you need it. Now, we're going to start the same thing to the right top to bottom. The first thing that I see here are these fingerprints, and they require red juice and a cleaning cloth also. Spray with red juice, all right, and agitate now with your toothbrush to get into these little corners here that you couldn't otherwise get to. That makes the cleaning much simpler. And then wipe it clean and dry. See how easy that goes? Looks just like new. That brings us to rule four which is, if it isn't dirty, don't clean it. That actually sounds a little bit like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But our rule isn't really all that obvious. You know, a lot of people trying to clean those couple of fingerprints here might have sprayed this entire door, at least all of that they can reach, which takes a little bit of time. And it takes even longer still to wipe it now all clean and dry. Really, all they wanted to do is clean those few fingerprints. So pay attention. If, if it isn't dirty, don't clean it, and just get the couple of fingerprints that you need. The same goes for vertical and horizontal surfaces. Vertical surfaces don't get as dirty as horizontal surfaces. Upper shells get less dust than lower shells, and the same goes for upper and lower molding. Now that we're done with the cupboard itself, let's go down to the counter here. And you know, if it weren't for counters, maybe, and the stove top, and the floor in the kitchen, there isn't much hard work to do. So let's talk about the counter a little while. And one of the reasons that the counter is hard to clean is that there's all these things sitting on it. The way to clean the things that are on it are, one, move the item away from where it was so you can reach behind it, put some red juice back there, and now clean the area that was right behind this uh, osterizer here. Now, oftentimes you want, before you move this back, you want to clean it. And oftentimes, you can clean it just with your red juice dampened cloth. But sometimes, you need to do even more. In fact, this has all these buttons that often drives us crazy. Let's clean those. I'm going to unplug it first, and then I'm going to just spray it with red juice. Let's start here and work our way down. Use the toothbrush in all these places. And then I can hardly wait to get these, all of these little buttons and get them all clean. And this really works. It's amazing how you can make this look just like new again. Okay, now everything's clean and loose. And we're going to wipe it dry. As say, it looks like you just got this when it came out of the box when your husband gave it to you for Christmas or wife, whoever. Now, see how I put the cloth over the toothbrush here? Now, by getting down in between each of these, all of that dirt that I got loosened up, I can really get it out. And now that really is clean. Before I move this back into place, I think I'm going to push the off button just to make sure I didn't turn it on when I was cleaning all of those little buttons. Now, put it back into place, and let's clean behind the canister. Move it out, clean behind it, and I'm just going to use my red juice dampened cloth. Set it back. There's really nothing to clean of the canister itself. 
and use a little red juice on the counter in front of both of these items and wipe it clean and dry. All right, so following our rule, we're moving to the right. We're going to come to a new set of counter here. You know how to clean a countertop by now, and you know how to clean the front of the cabinets below. Use your red juice and a cleaning cloth. Grab your toothbrush anytime you might need it. Now, moving right one more time, we come to a little bit more interesting stuff here on the countertop. Here's some, um, I guess they're just breadcrumbs or something. They're loose, and that means that we can kind of gather them up and drop them into our little debris pocket. And that works real well at getting rid of them. And if one or two of them fall to the floor, it's no big deal since we haven't cleaned the floor itself yet. Here comes something else. Um, I don't know what this stuff is, but my experienced eye tells me I think I want to use my white pad and the red juice. So let's spray it and then use your white pad on it. Oh, that's going to come up. Now what we're doing here is just getting it loose, and in a minute we will wipe it up with our cleaning cloth. But the point I'm making here is most of this gunk is now in your white pad and not on the countertop anymore. Now most of us have this irresistible urge to walk over to the sink and rinse this out. Well, I'm sorry, you don't get to do that. That's going to waste time. No matter how yucky this thing gets, it's not going to clean any better if you rinse it. So just stick it into your uh, plastic lined pocket and leave it there. Now, let's wipe the counter dry. Yeah, that came off nice and clean. And you notice every time I use this cloth, I keep putting it over my shoulder. Well, ultimately, this gets too dirty and wet and yucky for me to put it over my shoulder anymore, and I want a new cloth. When that happens, you've got a couple of choices. One is to put it behind the plastic that's in the pocket with the white pad. Your second choice if you're still halfway close to your tray, or if you're a pretty good shot, is just kind of toss it back to your tray. Now then, take another cloth and put it over your shoulder. Now sometimes when you're cleaning around the kitchen, you come to something you need a very dry cloth for. Chrome is a good example. And if this cloth is already a little wet, well, that's not a good cloth to use. So you might want to be using two cloths sometimes. Use a very dry one to dry chrome or glass or whatever you need, and then put it here hanging out. Now then, when this one is too wet, that'll be the one that you toss over your tray, and then you can rotate this one up to your shoulder. Before we move on, let's cover a couple more rules. Uh, the next rule happens to be rule five, and it is don't rinse or wipe a surface before it's clean. You may know what it's like. You're scrubbing and scrubbing and scrub scrubbing trying to get something clean, and you have this understandable tendency to want to wipe it kind of just to check and see if it's clean. Sometimes, unfortunately, that's only a form of wishful thinking because it's still dirty. So you need to learn to see through the dirt, really through the dirt. And if you can't do that, feel through the dirt because the surface feels differently when it's clean. And rule six is really just the flip of rule five. Don't keep working after it's clean. In other words, when you reach the actual surface, stop cleaning. Besides wasting time scrubbing something that's already clean, you can actually damage the surface of the countertop, and it wears out your cleaning cloth much quicker than you really want to. I'll have to admit that naturally this rule isn't violated nearly as often as any of the others. Let's find out what's next in the kitchen, shall we? Now we're at the stovetop. By now, you know I'm going to tell you to start above the stove, so check for any fingerprints in the cupboard above the stove. Above the stove also is often a filter and vent type of situation. Here's one that pulls out. Now often there, the filter is dirty. If it's dirty, don't even try to clean it though with your red juice and a cleaning cloth. Instead, put it in the dishwasher. In fact, that probably should have been a clean team rule. If it fits, put it in the dishwasher, as long as it's safe, of course. Also up here, there's often a light bulb, so be careful when you're spraying up there with your red juice. If it's hot, it's apt to explode. Let's look at the stove top itself. This is a gas stove, which is fine with me because I think they're actually a little bit easier to clean than an electric stove. But if you have an electric stove, the theory is all the same, so just follow along with this. That also brings us to another rule. It's rule seven, I think. If what you're doing isn't going to work, shift to a heavier duty tool. In other words, pick the tool that's strong enough for the job at hand. If you're using your cleaning cloth and you're not making much progress, jump up to your toothbrush or a white pad or the scraper or the razor. 
let's say you encounter some mystery substance like whatever this is here on the stove top. You know just by looking at it that your cleaning cloth isn't going to be strong enough and probably neither is the toothbrush. So at the first sign that your white pad isn't strong enough, jump up to another tool. Don't waste time continuing to try something that isn't working very well. Cut your losses. You'll actually get very good very fast at sizing up exactly what tool you need for the cleaning job at hand. That will save you from the wasting the time of all the intermediate steps of trying one tool at a time. So let's use our red juice and white pad and see what we can do with this stovetop and make it clean again. Let's make some room, some room for ourselves by moving this teapot out of the way. Now the way you actually start cleaning the stovetop is to take the left side grates and put them on top of the grates on the right side. Now, I'm going to use some of our famous red juice and see if we can get rid of this. Spray it liberally. You're going to need it on something like this. Now take your white pad and start agitating, working from the back. We're kind of going to work towards the front. Go down inside as needed and just make sure you get all the surfaces. This stuff's coming off pretty well, actually, isn't it? Here's that mystery glob. Okay, now once you have the surface well agitated, let's see and wipe it clean and dry with one of our cleaning cloths. Well, that's coming up nice and clean. All right, now when you finish the left side, take and put the grates back where they were. Now take the grates on the right side and set them to the right of the counter. Now you're going to clean the right side the way we just cleaned the left side. Use your red juice and a white pad. Ultimately you're going to come to some knobs. And that's one of those things that everybody either seems to dread or they just ignore them completely. And they can actually be one of the most gratifying things to clean in the kitchen because it looks so much better once you get them clean. And it's not all that difficult to do. This is one of those places where the toothbrush is a real champion. The way to clean them is to spray them in place with red juice. Now just go ahead and agitate the heck out of them with your toothbrush, okay? And just really, really go at it. Now these weren't too dirty to begin with, but when you clean them this way, you can make them look just absolutely like new again. The problem sometimes exists even though you get the the knobs themselves clean, you're unable to clean below them. So occasionally you may need to be cleaned below them. The way to do that is to lift up two of the knobs at a time straight up and set them in the same relative position over here on the counter to the right. That allows you to get to this stove top that was underneath the knob to begin with. You don't have to do this too often unless of course the chef in your house is more of the, the dribbling kind or the spilling kind or the flinging kind. When you're done, put them back in place, and it's pretty easy to do if you keep them in that same relative position. Make sure the stove stays off. Now continue on down, you're going to do the countertop in front, and then we're going to move on to the oven. Now we're at the oven, and in this house it looks like there's a microwave oven on the top. They're real easy to clean. Start with the inside, and all you need in here is your red juice and a cleaning cloth. Maybe once in a while you'll need a white pad or a toothbrush, but grab for them if you do. And don't worry about using red juice in there. Red juice is USDA approved for use around food, so it's safe. Now to clean the microwave on the outside, start at the top, and I'm just going to spray a little red juice right on my cloth to get this spot up here. Then just clean the front of the microwave. Mainly there's a few fingerprints here that you want to keep from accumulating. Of course, you need your toothbrush once in a while, or if you need your toothbrush once in a while, go ahead and use it. Now, here's something that we haven't talked about before. There's a vent here that gets dusty after a while. Well, we've been carrying this whisk broom around, and I'm going to go ahead and use that. Now, you notice that I use it dry. You don't want to turn that dust to mud before you uh, try to get rid of it. And that's probably something you're not going to have to do very often, but I'm sure the microwave will be happy that you clean it out once in a while. Now, we're not going to clean the oven itself, but there are a couple of things that you can do when you clean it on a weekly basis. I always clean, for instance, this top edge of the door. That's one of those horizontal surfaces that get dirty. 
Now on the inside, we can actually cheat and make it look like we've cleaned the whole oven by just cleaning the window on the inside. To do that, you need your red juice and your razor. Spray it with red juice. That gets the surface wet so we don't scratch with the razor. Now use your razor at a low angle and just get all this stuff loose. Isn't that easy? And as I say, it really does make it seem like you've cleaned the whole oven. And wipe it clean and dry. There, doesn't that look better? Well, that's it for the inside of the oven, all that we're going to do on normal weekly cleaning. You know how to clean the outside of the oven by now. Use your red juice, toothbrush in the nooks and crannies, and wipe it clean and dry, working your way down. It looks like in this house, the next thing we're going to come to is the refrigerator, so I'll meet you there. Since this is weekly cleaning, there's a couple of things we don't have to do with the refrigerator. And that's clean the inside of it, or heaven forbid, defrost the whole freezer part of it. So let's just follow the normal rules and start cleaning at the top. Use your feather duster there. That works real well. It's a nice flat surface. Now, you may not always be able to use your feather duster, and you might have to use your red juice once in a while. But use your feather duster when you can, because that's the faster of the two, two operations. Now, on the outside of the refrigerator itself, mainly you're going to look for fingerprints around the handle. You know to use your red juice around these buttons here, where people's fingers, especially the little dirty ones, hit all the time. Use your toothbrush in any place that you might suspect dirt will get, in this tight spot, the hinges up here, those kinds of places. But remember rule four, if it isn't dirty, don't clean it. Whole areas of this refrigerator never get touched, so don't absentmindedly, you know, spray the whole refrigerator and then have to wipe it clean and dry. There is one thing you should do on the inside of the refrigerator while you're doing we your weekly cleaning, and that is to keep this gasket clean. All sorts of spills fall in there, and things get trapped in this kind of accordion design of it. Use a little red juice, and then get your toothbrush in there. Really cleans this area out real nicely. Take a cleaning cloth and make it dry. While you're at it, clean this leading edge of the refrigerator here. That makes sure that where the gasket touches that edge, there's a nice good seal. Keeps all the cold air in. Probably even saves you a little bit of money. So the only thing now left to clean on this refrigerator is the vent down at the bottom of the fridge. This is another good place to use your whisk broom. And remember to use the whisk broom dry, of course. Well, that's it for the refrigerator. Now what you're going to do is continue moving around the kitchen, working to the right, never backtracking. If you've found you've backtracked, you know the most likely thing you've done is to put your red juice on a counter someplace, and so then you have to wander over and pick it up. Try not to do that. Put it back in your apron every single time. It's really amazing how fast you'll move around the room if you don't backtrack. All we have left in this kitchen, however, is the sink, so I'll see you there. Well, we're back at the sink, and that's good news, because that means we've just about completed our circle around the kitchen. It means we've just about cleaned the entire kitchen. Before we clean the sink itself, you know by now to look up. Use your feather duster if it's necessary up there. You've got windowsills. You'll use either your feather duster or a white uh, cleaning cloth and red juice. And this would also be a great spot to use a little blue juice if the window itself is dirty. Now. Notice there's no dishes around here. Well, the reason for that is because washing dishes is a daily job, and what we're doing here is a weekly job. So the time to do the dishes, of course, is before you start the cleaning of the kitchen. Also, when most people look at a kitchen sink and they're ready to clean it, they grab the comet and they start splattering comet all over the place. Well, we've decided that's not such a good idea because comet is too hard to rinse away. So we don't use comet anywhere but in the bowl itself. On the rim of the sink, we actually use red juice. So use your red juice on the rim of the sink. Now, the tool of choice is your trusty toothbrush. So use that to agitate all around all of these areas, like the faucet and the handle. And everyone's sink is a little bit different, so you know which places to use it around your own sink. Here's this rinse thing. 
just be sure to get all of those nasty areas real well. Use your cleaning cloth now to wipe this whole area clean and dry. You know, this sink doesn't have a chrome faucet, but a lot of them do. And if I had a chrome faucet, I would switch to my dry cloth and really give this a knockout shine. You know, the whole kitchen is going to look so nice that you might as well have streak-free, nice shiny chrome. Well, the next thing we need now is Comet for the inside of the sink. And we're always telling you to use Comet sparingly. One way we remind ourselves to do that is to take and move this tape to only expose a couple of holes on the, on the can and rather than throw it away. So sprinkle a little bit of Comet on both sides of the sink. Now you need, you know how to do that, but let me remind you that the tool of choice for agitating it is your white pad. And then you're going to use your toothbrush for all of these areas inside the sink, particularly around the drain. When you're finished with that, go ahead and rinse it. It's a little bit hard to rinse out, so it's often a good idea to use your fingers on the bottom of the sink just to make sure that it's all out. Especially if you don't have a white sink, it'll show up just as soon as the sink gets dry. Well, we're ready to do the floor. We're going to move the tray out of the room so that that won't be in here with a wet floor and we can't get it. Let's take out a couple of things that we're going to need. One is clear ammonia, and the other is this mop cover. We'll talk about that just a little more in a minute. I'm going to take the tray out of the room now and get the mop, and then we're going to do the floor. Well, I've been promising to tell you about this funny-looking mop. It also has kind of a funny-sounding name. It's called a shamop. That's S-H-M-O-P. And I hear it's short for shine and mop. Anyway, this mop is entirely different than the sponge or string mop that you might be used to. For starters, it cleans with terry cloth covers. This cover is actually removable, and it stretches over this plastic plate. Now, the thing that makes it work so fast is that this is about 8 by 15 inches in diameter. Compare that with the amount of surface that's on the floor when you use a regular sponge mop, which is a little strip, you know, about like this, and you can see why this is about three times faster than a regular mop. It also swivels in all different directions, which means it works real well when you're standing up. It means you can get into corners. It'll actually go under the front of the stove. You can see how thin it is here. Uh, when you're using it and one of the shamop covers gets dirty, rather than take it to the sink and rinse it, you just take it off and put on a new clean one. And when you're done with your cleaning, you throw the shamop covers into the washing machine along with your cleaning cloths. This also means it's very sanitary. It's like having a new mop every time you do the cleaning. Now, one last thing before we start using the shamop is sometimes you need to vacuum or sweep your kitchen floor before you clean it. If that's the case, you should go ahead and do that now. All right, so let's make ourselves up a cleaning brew here in the sink. I'm going to put a little water in here. You don't need much, just a couple of inches of water in the bottom of the sink, and then a couple of tablespoons of clear ammonia. I call it a couple of gurgles. That's about two tablespoons. Now then, this seems to be leaking out of there. Now that's all right. Take the shamop cover off and just dip it in the cleaning solution. And then what you're going to do is wring it so it's almost dripping wet. That's about the right way to start cleaning the floor with. And then put it back over the top of your shamop. What we're covering here is actually a real dense foam pad that allows you to put real even but strong pressure on the floor when you're doing the cleaning. You're going to really love this funny looking mop. Now we're going to go to the furthest corner of the kitchen and start our mopping and we'll kind of work our way back towards the sink. Let's start here. Start in the corner. Notice how I can get tight into the corner, and with just swiveling this, I can get 
right underneath these cabinets, almost no effort at all. Big strokes cover a long area, a little bit dirtier, slow down and go over it two or three times. Now I can swivel it once more and get tight against this cabinet. It also leaves it very dry, so you don't have to wait a long time before you use your kitchen floor. When you come to something like these dead raisins or whatever they are, go ahead and stop. Grab your red juice and spray them, and then get your scraper and get them loose. You know, there's some things that no mops can get up. And then just put them into your debris bag. When you finish one area of the floor, just back up a couple of steps and clean another area. You know, everyone's floor plans are a little bit different, so I'm not going to try to show you how to shamop this entire kitchen floor. But when you're doing your own floor, use landmarks for each area so that you don't overlap. After you've used the shamop for a while, it will get dirty or it'll get too dry. And when that happens, you're going to want to go to the sink and put on a fresh cover. So let's do that now. The thing to do with your dirty shamop cover is treat it just like you would a dirty cleaning cloth. So let's take it off, and I'm going to put it in my apron the same way that I would with the cleaning cloth. Now, I've showed you before how to get this wet and wring it out almost dripping, and then put on a clean shamop head. Okay. Now then, the last time you're at the sink with your shamop before you, and so you're never going to come back to the sink, this is a good time to let the water out of the sink and then do a quick rinse. A real heavy rinse isn't very necessary because we really haven't put any dirt into the sink. That's one of the nice things about these shamops. Also, grab your ammonia because you don't need that anymore, and I'm just going to put it in my apron here. Now then, let's go and finish up the floor as we mop our way out of the kitchen. If you want to leave a modest shine, we've had good luck with a product called Bright. Use plain water in the sink, without the ammonia of course, and follow the instructions on the label. The Shamop will work with most any floor cleaning product. Let's do this last bit of kitchen floor here as we kind of back our way out of the door that we originally came in. Good. Now you remember, of course, you're just going to pop these covers into the washing machine along with your cleaning cloths. And by the way, congratulations, you've just speed cleaned the kitchen. What we're going to do next is learn how to speed clean the bathroom. So I'm going to go back to the storage cabinet and change my carry-all tray around so I have the right tools, and then we'll start one more job. Hi. Once again, before we start the bathroom, let's look at the tools and supplies that you need just for the bathroom that we haven't seen before. Let me make a little room in my tray for them. Now, actually, you have seen a couple of the things we use. You know about Comet. Well, we're going to need that again in the bathroom. And a white pad, we're going to need that. And if you wear gloves, make sure that you carry your gloves with you. And of course, you're going to need a fresh supply of cleaning cloths, so we'll set these in here also. Now let's look at a couple of products that you haven't seen before. One of them is tile juice. Tile juice is great for getting scum and mineral deposits off of your shower walls. You know how big of a job that can be. What else do we have here? Oh yeah, we have a plastic cup that used to be filled full of ice cream. Now we use it to help rinse the shower. You can carry that over the top of your Comet. Um, if you have fiberglass showers or tubs, you need a specialized product and don't use tiles. You substitute a fiberglass cleaner. Going to need a couple of brushes. This is probably our favorite brush. This is a perfectly wonderful brush. You can see how the, the stiff bristles dig into the grout in the shower walls. And that's where we use it to clean the shower and the tub area. Uh, notice that they're synthetic bristles, not natural ones. Natural ones kind of tend to get a little soft over time. No matter, it's a great uh, brush to use in the bathroom. So we'll stick that in here. And there's one other brush that we need, of course, and that's one to clean the toilet with. Once again, this brush has 
synthetic bristles, nice stiff ones, and you'll notice the design of it allows the brush to get un up underneath the lip of the uh, toilet. This is a great little brush. You'll like it. There is one other product that we use in the bathroom, and it looks a little funny now because I've got a cloth draped over the top of it. The reason for that is that this is bleach. And you know what bleach can do. One little dribble of bleach on your carpet and you'll make a white spot that will last forever. So we keep it covered with this cleaning cloth, an old cleaning cloth, so that we don't leave any little trail on the way to the bathroom. We use this product in the bathroom to kill the mold or mildew that might be growing around your shower. We actually dilute it four parts water to one part bleach. And you can dilute it even more if you'd like to. But that's the one we use and it seems to work well for us. So I'm going to cover this as a good example to you when you're walking through the house. And I even take care to point it towards the middle of the cleaning tray so there can't, almost no way there can be an accident. Well, once again, it looks like I'm just about out of excuses, so I'm going to go clean the bathroom for you, and I'll see you there. Here we are in the bathroom everybody's favorite room to clean, right? But take heart, we'll soon have you out of here in 15 minutes or less. Just as in the kitchen, we're going to pick your starting point for you, and in the bathroom, that's at the end of the tub. So I'm going to put my carry-all tray right here at the end of the tub. And then, a couple of steps before we really start, and that is to take the trash and set it outside the door, and also any throw rugs. Now's the time to pick them up, set them outside the door, and lay them down flat so that you can come by later and vacuum them. If you don't have your apron on, now's the time to put it on. So when you do that, make sure you check and make sure that your three tools are in place. Your blue juice is on your left side, red juice on your right side, and I've got my white pad in my line pocket here. Now, you may notice that I haven't put the feather duster in my back pocket nor the whisk broom in my other back pocket. And the reason for that is, is in the bathroom, we're going to make two trips around the room. The first one to do the wet work. That's the work that requires those brushes that we were just talking about. But it's mainly the tub and shower, and also the sink, and also the toilet. And then we're going to make a second trip around the room, never backtracking, of course, and do everything that's left. But that's a lot of spraying and wiping, kind of like in the kitchen. Now, is that clear? I want to make sure that we know that there is an exception here. Two trips around the room. First, to do the wet work, and then a second trip to do everything that's left, and then we'll do the floor last. We're going to start with the tub and shower, and the first step is to take out of the way any little items that are going to be in your way later on. So let's do that now. Well, I guess my rubber ducky's going to be in the way, and the shampoo. So let's set them right outside the tub on the floor. And while we're down here, it's a good idea to set the soap out also. And it's usually kind of a mess on the bottom side. So turn it over and set it on a cloth. That'll also keep it from picking up all the hairs off of the floor when you put it back also. The next step is to wet down the shower walls. And we use cold water just the way it comes out of the shower head. We don't wait for the warm water for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, it conserves water by not letting the water run until you get the right temperature. But the other reason is, if the water gets too warm, it'll steam up the whole bathroom, and then it makes it kind of hard to clean some of the surfaces. Try to do this entire job of cleaning the tub and the shower walls while standing outside of the tub, right on the floor. Don't step into the tub. And there's a good reason for that, of course, and that is as soon as you apply some tile juice, and you start liberating that soap scum that was on the wall and it gets down in the bottom of the tub, it gets very slippery. So don't get in there. And usually you don't have to. Your arms are long enough, especially since you've got the tile brush in your hand. If you have to get into the tub, however, be careful. And it's a good idea to wear non-slip shoes and put down a couple of cleaning cloths, one for each foot. So let me grab my tile juice and my tile brush, and we'll do the next step. Okay, now the wall that you're going to do first is the wall that's furthest from the drain. That's this wall right here. I'm not going to start there only because you can't see it as well as you can see another wall. 
Also, remember, there's a part of the wall that doesn't normally get wet, doesn't get any soap scum on it. So don't clean that part of the wall if you don't need to. Now, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to start here. Wet the shower walls before you start applying the tile juice. Now, to apply the tile juice, put a line here. Then I'm just going to spread it around with my tile brush. And you notice I'm not really agitating and I'm not scrubbing it. We're going to come back in a minute or two and do that. When you come to the soap tray, take the time to clean it. You can use the handle end of your toothbrush to knock loose these big pieces of soap. Now flip your toothbrush around and use the brush end to do the rest of it. Don't rinse or wipe it yet. When you come to the fixtures, just go ahead and cover them with tile juice when you're doing the wall close to them. If your bathroom has shower doors, Treat them just the way you did the shower walls. In other words, put some tile juice on them and then spread it around evenly with your tile brush. Once you've done that, you've now covered all three walls and the shower doors and we're ready to go back over the walls one more time and agitate them. The reason that we made this two times around is because in the ensuing time, chemistry has had a chance to do its duty and that soap scum and the mineral deposits are now loosened up and our job is much easier the second time around. When scrubbing, work in small circles. Allow the bristles to really dig into the grout. When you come to these fixtures, just go right ahead and scrub right over the top of them. You know, even after you've scrubbed with your towel brush, there's often mold left growing all along here and here and other places. Don't worry about it. There's other places here where you often see it. We're going to get it just before we leave the bathroom by putting some bleach on those spots. When you come to the shower doors, it's a good idea to change tools. Don't use the brush on the glass. The white pad actually works better on that nice smooth surface. When you come down to the bottom of the shower doors and you get to those nasty runners, you have a couple of tools in your apron that you can use to clean them. One of them is our favorite, of course. It's the toothbrush. And if you move the toothbrush around to different angles, you can actually get into almost all of the corners of the shower runner and get it clean. If it doesn't work, however, because of the design of your particular shower door, we can also use the white pad in a new way. And what I've done here is now fold it in half. Now, insert the whole thing into the shower runner and move it back and forth. That will almost always get out all of the hair and scum that accumulates down there, and it will accommodate very, a lot of different sizes of runners. Now, if you have shower curtains, don't even try to clean those while they're in place. The best idea is to take them down and put them in the washing machine with a couple of towels. It's probably a good idea to take it out before the, the spin cycle and don't put it in the dryer. Just hang them back up, and the wrinkles will come out within a day or so. Now, We've cleaned all of the shower walls and the shower door and the runners, and now it's time to clean the tub itself. You notice we haven't rinsed yet. This is just a big bubbly mess, all the walls and everything, but we're only going to rinse one time, and that's after we've finished the tub. It saves a lot of time. So let's grab for our comet, and we're going to apply a little comet to the tub. 
You know how to do that. We're real sparing with it. We don't want to want to use much. It's hard to rinse away, and especially if you get it outside the rim of the tub itself. Keep it in the bowl of the tub. Now let's scrub. Well, everything's now scrubbed, and finally, it's time to rinse. One thing I'm not going to rinse, however, though, is this tile brush. I'm going to set it as is, full of comment, in the sink, and we're going to use it there in a few minutes. Now, regarding rinsing, it's much easier chore if you have one of those shower heads that's on a hose, you know, really makes this job easy. However, if you have the normal kind, I'm going to show you how to use that, and we'll get most of it and make it a little easier. Use a shower head, of course, move it back and forth, and you can get most of the areas. You notice I don't have the water on. Uh, you wouldn't be able to hear me over it, besides which I'm apt to make a big mess. When you want to rinse this front wall here, use your hand to deflect the water. You see how I'm doing that? That works real well. If there's a few areas that you're just unable to get, no matter which way you turn your shower head, remember that cup that we had over the top of the comet in our carry-all tray? Catch some water with it, and then use that to get those last nasty unrinsed corners. Now, in general, the way that you want to rinse is to start on the walls and work them from the top to the bottom and towards the back. And then when you rinse the tub, rinse it from the back to the front towards the drain. The next thing on our agenda is the toilet. On our wet trip around the bathroom, when we come to the toilet, all we're going to clean is the inside of the bowl. And to do that, you need your toilet brush and, of course, a little comet. And this is easy enough. Just put a little comet in the water. Get your toilet brush a little wet and then put some comet on that also. Now, let's start up underneath the edge here. All sorts of gremlins seem to grow there. And then just work your way methodically down. And when you're done, just go ahead and flush it. It's a good idea to rinse out your toilet brush as the toilet is rinsing itself out. And now you're done with your toilet brush and your comet, so let's put them back in our tray. The only thing left to clean on our wet trip around the bathroom is the sink. And once again, we're just going to clean the bowl of the sink. Remember, we left our brush in here, and we're ready to use that as is. Put a little water in the sink first. Just use the brush methodically. You know how to do that by now. I don't need it here, but feel free to use your toothbrush down here if it's necessary. Once you're done, rinse it out. I'm also rinsing out my uh, tile brush because now we're done with the wet work and we'll start our other trip around the room. Before you start your second trip around the room, you need to grab a couple of things from your cleaning tray. One of them is the feather duster, and I'm going to put that back in my pocket like I did before. And the other is the whisk broom, which I'm going to put in my other back pocket. Now, you're going to start cleaning around the room, doing everything that we haven't done so far. And you actually know how to do most all of that. You know you're going to start at your cleaning tray, and you're going to work your way to the right, working from top to bottom. Use your red juice if you come to fingerprints. Grab your toothbrush anytime you come to a tight spot, anything like that. You know the feather duster will reach up and knock down a cobweb. The first thing that we come to, in, come to in the bathroom, however, that we really haven't talked about before is the toilet. And we cleaned the inside of the toilet, but we haven't cleaned the outside of the toilet yet. So we're going to do that next. When cleaning the toilet, start at the top. You're used to that. And use your red juice and a cloth up here. Clean your way down. Now the important thing here is how to clean 
the toilet and the cover, the toilet seat and the cover. It's really pretty simple. First, move everything up. Now, you're going to need your red juice and a cloth here, so let's get them prepared. First, get everything wet with red juice. So clean or start with the undercover and then the seat and then under here and the top. And don't forget this area back here with the hinges. That little bit of porcelain gets real dirty. Now we're going to do everything in reverse order when we clean it. So now we've just sprayed it. Grab your toothbrush because you're going to use it a lot here. And the first place is around these hinges back here. All right, now wipe that area clean and dry. Now, wipe the top of the cover dry. Open it up. Use your toothbrush again around these protectors and again around the hinges on the inside. And then wipe that dry. This toothbrush really comes in handy here. You can keep, you know how dirty it can get around these hinges. It makes it stay like new for a long time. Now, wipe the top of the toilet seat itself. And finally, lift that up. And there's a, several more targets for your toothbrush down in here. Great. Now that's the cover and the seat done. Let's do the top of the toilet itself. And there's one more spot on the front of these hinges that you can get. If you're real careful, you don't have to redo your work here because you've already cleaned the bottom or the back half of those hinges right here. Now I'm kind of cleaning the front half of it. All right. Now. Wipe that all clean and dry. One more area of the toilet that gets dirty, and that's, of course, the front of it. So let's spray a little down here and also around those annoying little knobs that are so hard to clean. But they get dirty. So let's wipe once more. Clean the front. And there's another spot for your toothbrush around that knob. Great. Now, of course, do the same thing on the other side. You know, there's one other thing that you should do. As long as I'm here, eyeball to eyeball with the toilet, I don't want to have to get down here again. So clean the floor around the toilet right now. Since this is carpeted, grab your whisk broom and use it to clean all of those areas that the vacuum is never going to get. Along here, here. Now, of course, do that same thing on the other side, but you get the idea. Your vacuum cleaner isn't going to fit in there, so now it's nice and clean and it's ready to be vacuumed up to your already cleaned areas. The same holds true if you've got no carpeting, if you've got linoleum or whatever. Use your red juice and a cleaning cloth and clean this area of the floor so that later on you're not going to have to get back down in this position. As you work your way around the bathroom, ultimately you're going to find yourself at the sink for the second time. Now I'm going to bring up a rule. I haven't had a rule for you for a while, but this is rule number eight. And the rule is, keep your tools in impeccable shape. The reason I'm bringing that up at this particular moment is because there's a spot of paint here on the mirror and I'm going to grab for my razor blade holder so that I can take that off. Now, once I get my razor blade out, and instead of finding a nice sharp razor, I find a rusty stump, I'm going to waste time because I'm going to have to go wandering through the house looking for a spare one. Either that, or I'm going to ignore this spot of paint again. We've probably been ignoring it for years. So, keep your tools in impeccable shape. Let's take the paint off of the mirror, shall we? Wet it with a little blue juice, and now get it loose. See how easy that goes? If you have that tool, you'll use it. As long as we're here, of course, you need to finish off the mirror. And a big mirror like this, you can often just touch it up a little bit. There, that's finished. 
about all that's left in this bathroom was the sink. Remember, we've done the bowl of the sink, so let's do the faucets back here. Well, those faucets look nice now. The only thing that's really left in here is to finish off the countertop, you know how to do that, and the cabinet front, and work your way around the rest of the room until you come back to your carry-all tray. Since this bathroom is carpeted, you can just vacuum the floor whenever you do your vacuuming. However, there is something left to do in here, and that is to apply a little bleach to those moldy areas that were in the shower. So the way to do that is take your tray, set it outside of the room. Now walk in with your bleach, and dribble a little bleach right onto those nasty, moldy areas. Now go ahead and leave the room. You don't want to smell that stuff. Come back in a few minutes, five minutes or probably is about right, and rinse the bleach off. That's also a good time to put the rubber ducky back and the shampoo, and you're done. You have actually speed cleaned a bathroom. Now, if you have a tile floor, however, it's a little bit different. First of all, grab your carry-all tray and take it out of the room. However, go back into the room with your red juice and a few cleaning cloths because you're going to use those to clean the floor. And I actually get down on my hands and knees in the far corner of the room and spray the, the floor with a little bit of red juice and then use those cleaning cloths to wipe it up. Fold the cleaning cloths real regularly so that you'll fold up all the hair and debris that you're wiping up. Leave the room and you're done, except for that bleach. So walk back in, put a little ble bleach on it, and once again, when I say dribble, I'm saying that because I don't want you to spray it into the air while you, where you will breathe it. So just kind of dribble it right on those moldy areas. Leave the room, come back in a few minutes, rinse it off, put the rubber ducky back, and you're finished. The only job that we have left is to go dust and vacuum the rest of the house, so I'll meet you there. Well, hello again. We're going to have to quit meeting like this, but actually we're going to because we're just about to start the last job. This last section of the tape is relatively short, but we're going to cover a whole grab bag of jobs. We're going to talk about dusting and vacuuming and polishing and the, all of the rest of the rooms of the house, everything but the kitchen and the bathroom. Let's see. Let's get out the cleaning tray. We've seen that before, so I'll set it here on the counter. You know we need a supply of cleaning cloths by now, so I'm going to add them into the carry-all tray. If we're going to dust, we generally need some furniture polish, and the one that we use is this Old English here. It's in a pump spray container that we like real well. It's also a nice cleaner. You may not think of it, but it's good for cleaning plastic surfaces such as the telephone, for instance. Naturally, there are better cleaners. There's paste waxes and all sorts of fancy ones, but this is just fine for weekly cleaning, and it has a nice odor to it also. To have a place to store this in your apron, what we do is remove one of the plastic liners, and here's how you do that. Set the apron down here on the counter. First, you remove these two simple metal clips. And then you just slip the plastic bag out of the pocket. By the way, these plastic liners are disposable. When they get gross, just toss them. For now, we're going to set it in the cleaning closet here. One more item in our closet is a dusting cloth. This is a good old American, all American dusting cloth. You've seen them before. One thing to remember about it, however, is to make it a dedicated cleaning cloth. Don't use it for anything else. In fact, don't even put it in the washing machine with your regular cleaning cloths. You might get comet with them, and then you could actually uh, scratch the surface of your furniture instead of polish it. That goes into the cleaning tray. And the last item in our closet here is a 50-foot extension cord. We can show you how to save a lot of time in vacuuming by plugging in the vacuum once and vacuuming the entire house without stopping. In fact, we could probably improve your vacuuming by 20% or so. 
We have it on a cord caddy, which is kind of a plastic carry-all, and it allows you to keep the cord organized between weekly cleanings. So let's drop that into our cleaning tray also. And I think we're ready to start that last job. Now I'm ready to do the dusting. You notice that I set my tray just inside the door, like you're used to seeing me do. We're in the living room, but when you're doing the dusting, it doesn't matter which room you start in, really. Floor plans are so different from house to house that you could decide to start in the dining room or the bedroom. But starting in the living room is just fine, and that's where a lot of people would like to start. I'm all dressed for dusting and have my apron on. You notice that I've got my familiar red juice and blue juice in their spots. There is some differences, however, and I, because I've got furniture polish in this pocket and a furni furniture polishing cloth, remember that's the pocket that used to be lined that I carried a white pad in. I've also got my whisk broom that will come in real handy when you're doing the dusting. And also, a feather duster. Makes sense that we're really going to use this now that we're doing the dusting. The strategy is the same, however, and that is you're going to start in one spot and proceed around the room, never backtracking. When you finish the first room, walk into the second room and go around that room without backtracking. So let's say the dining room is next to the living room. You make one trip around the living room, kind of loop in the dining room and make another trip, come out and go into the next room in a logical sequence. When you're doing the dusting, you're actually doing a lot of different things, considering that you've got red juice and blue juice and the, and the whisk room and the duster, and you've got furniture polish. So it's very important that you do everything that needs to be done in each spot before you move on. In other words, finish all of the dusting, all of the polishing, the wiping, the brushing, the tidying, all of those things in one spot before you move on. Now, before I start, I'm going to put a dry cloth over my shoulder, as you've seen me do before, so it will be ready to use. And that kind of brings me to rule number nine, and that is that repetition makes for smooth moves. If I decide that I'm going to carry this cloth over my shoulder, then carry it there all the time, and you can reach for it automatically. The same idea with your red juice. If you pick it up and put it back in the same place all the time, you can reach for it without looking, and you can put it back without looking. Everything goes so much more smoothly and quickly if you put things back in the same spot. While we're at it, let's cover the last few rules. There's only four left. Number 10 is pay attention. Everything falls into place if you do. If you're cleaning, just clean. And rule 11 is keep track of your time. Get a little faster every time. It's amazing how that happens kind of automatically anyway, and it makes you feel very gratified. Rule 12, use both hands. If you stop and think about it, one half of your workforce is idle if you're only using one hand. Now, you can't always use two hands, of course, but oftentimes, for example, you could be spraying with one hand and wiping with the other. And the last rule, and actually our most favorite, is if there's more than one of you, work as a team. House cleaning is so much more fun if you work as a team. The way we're going to demonstrate to you how to dust is to show you a few different spots in this room and demonstrate exactly how a duster would approach the problems that you come to. For example, to my left, I'm going to work by starting in the corner. Now, actually, I can't reach that corner from here to knock down any cobwebs that might be up there. So a smart way to handle that problem is to grab a wand from your vacuum cleaner, drop your feather duster in it, and now you can knock down any, any cobwebs in the corner. Once you do that, I'm going to work my way down and come to this plant. Now, contrary to popular opinion, you don't get to ignore plants. It's a good idea to dust them, and it's easy enough to do. You just kind of work your way down, knocking the dust and the cobwebs off. Actually, from what I hear, some gardeners actually use these to remove mites from the leaves, so it's good for the plants. Now, I continue all the way down to the floor because there's molding, 
And also, use your feather duster right on the floor on any places that the vacuum cleaner isn't going to get because you can pull out dust and hairs and dog hairs if you've got a house like mine that are under there so later on you're not going to have to move the furniture. Next, I come to this chair here. And there's not much to do on the chair either, but if it's one of those places where your cat likes to sleep, use your whisk room. It's a lot simpler than dragging out the vacuum cleaner, and it also gets hairs out of this crevice here. It does a real nice job. One place to remember to use your feather duster is up inside lampshades. A lot of cobwebs gather there. Of course, you remember to use it on the outside, but also use it on the inside. Now, let's talk a little bit about the proper way to use this feather duster, because used properly, it's a great tool. A very important principle is to bring it to a complete stop at the end of each time you use it. If you don't do it and you go like this, you're going to throw dust into the air and it's going to settle back down on what you've already cleaned. However, you come to a complete stop. The dust that was up there is actually now in the feather duster. And what you're going to do when it gets to be too much dust in the feather duster, or just whenever you think of it, is knock it against your ankle. That loosens up the dust. It's going to settle to the floor, and you'll vacuum it away a little later. When you come to a glass coffee table like this, you really can't get away with feather dusting it because there's too many fingerprints on it each week. So the way to clean it is, one, set the things off that are in the way. And I'm not going to move this off because it's so heavy and no, no dirt's getting underneath of it, but it's a good idea to feather dust it. Knock any of the dirt loose, it's going to fall down later. Now, we need blue juice to clean the, the top of the glass table. Lightly, lightly. Now, wipe it dry, and you know how to do that. One way to reduce streaks is to keep turning over your cloth so that you're always using a nice dry part of the cloth. Streaks come from leaving it slightly damp, and then when it dries, that equals a streak. Great. So when that's done, put the uh, tchotchke back. Before I set it on there, let me wipe the top of it off. I'm going to just use my already damp blue juice cloth. All right. Now, there are a couple of other things that we can do before we leave. Dust accumulates under here on these legs. Notice how my feather duster will get under there, knock all of that dust loose. Isn't that smart? And the whisk broom will get around these legs on that little spot that the vacuum cleaner won't reach. That way you don't have to move the table when you do your vacuuming. When you come to your couch, don't forget that you've got your trusty whisk broom available. Most of the time, you can actually use it to get, you know, whatever's on the couch and knock it onto the floor. Now, sometimes it's just going to be too much for the whisk broom, and you'll need to vacuum it. Just remember to follow the rules and vacuum it before you do the floor. Light switches are a great place to use your red juice and a toothbrush because everybody gets their fingerprints on the light switches. See how that just gets into these corners? Turning the light off and on, but I guess that's okay. Let's turn it off. Now wipe it dry. Perfect. Something that a lot of people seem to ignore are little spots on the carpet, such as, oh, dribbles of coffee or little spots of food. It's a good idea to put a little red juice on it, agitate it with your brush, blot it back up with a white cloth. And that should keep the carpet looking nice for a long time if you do that. Straighten that back out. The same thing goes with the hardwood floor. Don't ignore little dribbles. Put your red juice on the floor. It's not going to hurt it. If you need your toothbrush, use it. Now wipe it back up. That's also part of weekly cleaning. Before long, if you follow the rules, you will have dusted your way through all the rest of the house, doing all of the dusting and the tidying and the polishing that needs to be done. Now, all that stands between you and all that free time we've been promising you is the vacuuming. Well, we're down to just vacuuming left, and we will have cleaned an entire house. Luckily, also, I don't have as much to say about vacuuming, so this will be a relatively short section. 
You notice I don't have my red juice and blue juice on anymore. You don't really need them when you're doing the vacuuming, and they might get in your way. I do carry my whisk broom and my duster just in case I run into some debris that I'd like to sweep out into the way of the vacuum cleaner. The most important thing that I can tell you about vacuuming, at least that's going to save you a lot of time, is to plug in your vacuum cleaner once and never plug it in again. And obviously the way to do that is with a long extension cord. Here's the extension cord and I plugged it in on the wall there. Now, instead of plugging it directly into the vacuum cleaner, tie it into a knot first. The reason that you're doing that is that the first time you give it a little yank, it's not going to pull loose and drive you crazy. Regarding the vacuuming itself, try to keep the cords behind you. That way you're not tripping over them quite as much. And vacuuming kind of follow the clean team rules. In other words, don't backtrack. If it's dirtier, go over the area slower. If it's less dirty, you can speed up your vacuuming and go around the room methodically. Let me show you a little bit. Notice how I overlap on my return stroke. Use landmarks like furniture or plants so that you don't vacuum the same area twice or skip areas. Now here I can't, but tilt furniture if possible or use a whisk broom so you don't have to move the furniture at all. Remember, thanks to that extension cord, you're going to vacuum your way from this room to the next room and then throughout the house without stopping to unplug and replug the vacuum. When vacuuming stairs, follow the rule and start at the top and work down. We use these canister type vacuum cleaners and the way I do it is to set the canister down a few steps and then vacuum my way down to it and then move it down a few more steps. Whenever there's any kind of debris in any of the corners, grab your whisk broom and whisk it out. Use the whisk broom to dig all of this debris right out of the edge of the wall next where the carpet meets it. See all that stuff flying out of there? save a lot of time and what you're really doing is just moving in an inch or two so it's going to be in the path of the vacuum and it'll get vacuumed away. Don't hesitate to use your whisk broom. It'll come in real handy and it really can keep the steps looking nice without a lot of extra work with the vacuum cleaner. So let me vacuum these stairs for you. Once you're done vacuuming, you're also done with the house. I promised I'd tell you how to order the same personally safe, efficient, fast tools and supplies we use ourselves to save time day after day in San Francisco. Please call us at 800-238-2996 to order supplies, ask a cleaning question, or order a catalog. Or visit our website at www.thecleanteam.com. Well, there's speed cleaning in a nutshell. We hope you enjoyed it and that you benefited from it. We've heard from thousands of people that have told us that learning speed cleaning has had a real important and positive effect on their lives. If you would like any more information or if you have some questions, don't forget our books, but also give us a call. We love to talk about cleaning. Thanks and good luck. Thank you.